So it's my pleasure to discuss for you today a little bit about OCD. All of us have intrusive thoughts, and many of us from time to time, and many of us have occasional rituals. That isn't OCD. OCD, to be OCD, to be a disorder, these obsessions and compulsions have to be time-consuming, impair functioning, or generate a lot of distress. Individuals that have obsessive compulsive disorder tend to have obsessions, these intrusive, repetitive thoughts um, associated with compulsions. Um, the obsessions increase the anxiety and the compulsions decrease the anxiety. These symptoms can interfere uh, in a patient's life or functioning in that they are time-consuming. They can be preoccupying and uh, impact a patient's concentration. Uh, they can also interfere in relationships. At its essence, uh, OCD is a disease of pathological doubt. Individuals are unable to distinguish between what is likely, what is unlikely, and what is highly likely. They believe that even the unlikeliest of outcomes is very likely. The reason these doubts plague people with OCD is because they believe that something catastrophic will happen uh, if they are wrong. Uh, they have a very tender conscience and they believe that if they uh, are wrong, the outcomes could be catastrophic. So think about OCD as a little troll sitting inside your head convincing you that uh, you did something wrong. To start, the diagnostic criteria that have been outlined in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual in our current edition, the fourth edition, uh, lays out some specific criteria for how someone would be diagnosed with uh, OCD. Uh, the first prominent component of the uh, diagnostic criteria is the presence of obsessions. And obsessions have been defined as some kind of recurrent uh, and intrusive thought or image that the person experiences and that they would also experience this disturbance as unwanted and that it would cause uh, some kind of anxiety or distress to the sufferer. Um, these usually are not ones that are just excessive concerns about everyday worries or, uh, or other things that are real life problems. They would usually take the shape of something that is unreasonable or impossible to happen or very highly unlikely to happen. The sufferer, for it to be an obsession, they usually go through some effort to suppress the thoughts. They do some active uh, action to try and eliminate the thought. This might be the form of some effort to suppress the thought that they'll describe uh, systematically like some kind of internal punishment to stop the thought, telling themselves to stop it, or they may engage in some kind of neutralizing behavior designed to eliminate the thought. And the person has to recognize that these intrusive thoughts are also the product of their mind, that they are uh, something that comes from within them and not, uh, and not placed there from some external source. Another major criteria for uh, someone to be diagnosed with OCD is that they would have compulsions. Um, and those are defined by a couple of different specific uh, criteria. One is that there would be some repetitive behavior. This might be hand washing, ordering things, uh, checking things, or they might engage in some kind of mental activity. Uh, this could include things like praying or counting or some other kinds of repeating action that's designed to neutralize the obsession. OCD 
is recognized by experts as being a very heterogeneous disorder. It's one that's marked by great variability. There's a theme called forbidden or taboo thoughts. And these are thoughts, images, or impulses that people have that are really of a um, uh, upsetting nature. So for example, uh, one type of uh, taboo thought that people can have are about sexual content. Another one is about violent content. And a third one is about uh, religious content. So let's talk about the sexual content first. Uh, so again, many different types of content, many different types of thought. I mean, you name it, any boundary that someone can cross can be the can be the basis of an obsession of sexual taboo thoughts. So for example, you can have intrusive thoughts or images about having sex with someone that you're not supposed to be having sex with, like a child or your parent. Um, you can have intrusive fears about being homosexual if you're heterosexual or heterosexual if you're homosexual. You can have um, a sexually aggressive thoughts like uh, having images or thoughts about raping someone. And again, this is in the context of someone who has none of these desires at all, is typically horrified um, by having these thoughts and sees themselves as a terrible person. Um, and another content of sexual thought would be incest. Sometimes people wonder what's the difference between OCD with sexual taboo thoughts and pedophilia. And so pedophilia are people who are actually sexually attracted and have sexually pleasurable fantasies around having uh, sex with children. And that's quite different than having uh, a se obsessive compulsive disorder and having intrusive images or thoughts about having um, sex with a child, um, but actually not wanting to have sex with a child and being horrified by having these thoughts and feeling like a bad person. So here's what we say to people with OCD who have um, sexual thoughts about am I gay or if they're gay, you know, am I heterosexual. Um, the whole idea here is um, not to tell them what they are. You know, sexual orientation is sexual orientation. But people, um, but, the, but the whole point is, is that if they are having OCD thoughts around it, they can't even figure out who they are. Obviously, there are people who are not sure whether they're gay or not, and they're trying to figure it out. But again, that's very different than someone with um, uh, intrusive sexual thoughts, whether they're gay. Usually in that case, for example, you'll see someone who has a pattern of heterosexual relationships are in heterosexual relationships and suddenly again are having intrusive thoughts or images of a homosexual nature, which is very distressing and upsetting. That's quite different than uh, following a sexual history of someone and seeing that there's some question about what their sexual identity is. People also can have aggressive, violent thoughts or images, and I mean these are like ugly, you know, stabbing or killing your child, stabbing or killing your mother. Um, you know, we already talked about sexual aggressive uh, interests of thoughts, you know, raping someone. So these are, um, uh, again, very taboo thoughts. This isn't how we usually think about murdering other people, um, but this is another form that taboo thoughts can take in OCD. The aggressive thoughts can be directed towards anyone, including yourself. Although usually we find, when we see patients like this, often these thoughts are directed towards people they care about the most. And that's why the thoughts and images are so upsetting to them. And then there's one other domain of taboo thoughts that we should talk about, which is also um, occurs, which are taboo thoughts about religion. And um, these can take, again, there's just many different forms of it, um, but if you think about it is it's someone's having an intrusive thought or image that is against their religious beliefs or against their religion of choice, um, that's why it's a taboo thought or image. And again, intrusive, highly distressing. Even if you're not a religious person, uh, people can have taboo thoughts around morality. Have I done the right thing? Have I done the wrong thing? Or breaking rules, codes of social behavior um, that you don't nor normally do. And again, all of this would be considered taboo forbidden thoughts or impulses um, that generate anxiety and distress. Another major category is doubting and checking. So uh, people who check things have also some doubts as to whether or not they completed actions properly or if they completed them at all. What if I didn't do something right? What if I don't remember something? As an example, someone might be worried that they, the stove isn't off. They might check and recheck over and over again to make sure that they actually turned the stove off. They might turn lights off and on just to make sure it's actually off when they do it. 
um, someone may worry or have a doubt that they paid money to somebody and they gave a cashier incorrect change and they might worry uh, or doubt that they gave them the correct change and they might have a catastrophic outcome in their head um, that goes something like what if the person gets fired if I didn't give them the right change um, and as a result that doubt they might come back and check with the cashier if they gave them the correct change and they might do this over and over again. Um, these are examples of behavioral rituals that OC people with OCD might do um, and this is their way of looking at the environment to convince themselves that they did something correctly. Um, they might also do something called mental rituals and there what they do is they assuage their doubt by reliving information that's already inside their head. So they might uh, doubt their motivation for something, you know, maybe I don't love my spouse. Uh, they might doubt their feelings about something. They might doubt, what if I'm gay? You know, what if I um, cheat on my spouse? So they might have um, doubting um, worries like that, and then they might um, re maybe mentally review events of the past, or they might uh, say safe things inside their head to convince themselves that they're correct, that they do love their spouse, that they wouldn't cheat on somebody. They might doubt if they've actually understood some information. So they might read a, a paper and, and, and doubt whether they actually absorbed the information. So they might review the information over and over inside their head to again relieve themselves of this doubt. Another example of a behavioral ritual might be that someone's car may hit a pothole and they may doubt that uh, they actually, they might uh, be concerned that they might have hit somebody and they might doubt uh, whether or not they saw the person, so they might retread their steps, re re drive their car over the same spot again, uh, and then try to see if they find the person. After they leave the situation, they might come back again, again doubting whether they actually hit somebody or not. And this could go on for days. So imprisoned by their doubts, people with OCD uh, are you know, get this short-term relief when they do these behavioral or mental rituals. Uh, and that l relief is short-lived, however. And once again, that little doubting troll will come back and say, what if you didn't? Well, what if you did? Uh, and then back to, again, the same actions again to relieve themselves of their doubt. Another major category of symptoms in OCD are concerns with symmetry and ordering. Uh, this is something that involves people scanning the environment, often their own home environment, but it could be any environment that they happen to fall into, and uh, actively try to arrange uh, things so that they are symmetrical on left and right, top and bottom, or they might feel the intense urge to order things in some meaningful way. Let me give you some clinical examples of these symptoms. Uh, patients with, with these symptoms may um, may insist on having their clothing arranged in, in, by size or by color, or groceries on their shelves arranged in, uh, by shape. Uh, they may insist that office supplies uh, on their desk uh, be at right angles uh, or in particular spots on the desk. They may have preoccupation with the direction in which their handwriting uh, appears or the size and shape of particular letters. This can even uh, manifest in terms of the way a patient walks uh, and how the walking feels and whether um, those steps are done in a, a symmetrical or orderly way. Appearance can also uh, be impacted in that a patient may insist that one strand of hair be exactly the same length as another strand of hair. Food on, on a patient's plate may need to be arranged in a particular way. There are two ways that symmetry obsessions can manifest. Some patients report magical thinking associated with these symptoms and that they have a feared consequence if objects are not aligned in a particular way. So for example, a patient may report that his mother may be in a terrible accident if, if his objects on his desk are disturbed. Other patients uh, don't report magical thinking, instead they describe an uncomfortable or uh, imperfect feeling uh, if, if objects are not aligned in a particular way, or they may need to repeat an action over and over until it feels right or until it feels complete. 
So again, these patients don't report feared consequence, but it's more of an internal feeling that drives their, their symptoms. In school settings or work settings, these patients will have difficulty in completing assignments on time, and their difficulty in completing assignments can be interpreted by others as laziness or oppositional behavior. It's important to uh, consider uh, differential diagnoses uh, with regard to symmetry and, and order and because preoccupation with order can also come up in obsessive compulsive personality disorder. The difference there is that uh, patients with OCPD uh, want objects to be arranged in that way and it, it feels uh, feels right for them that they, that they feel like this is the way everybody should have their objects arranged. About one quarter to one third of patients with OCD will have comorbid OCPD and when both of these uh, diagnoses occur together you're more likely to see the incompleteness that I talked about earlier. Another major category of OCD is, in, uh, is hoarding. Uh, this is where people uh, seek to collect, uh, gather, or save uh, goods often in a single category or, or a few different categories, but some people feel the need to hoard uh, virtually everything that they get their hands on. First is sentimental, which is that um, individuals feel so um, attached to a particular um, object. For example, um, people have difficulty discarding things like empty um, uh, uh, empty food containers, uh, clothing that no longer fits them, and uh, what they describe is this feeling of, um, you know, I know the jeans don't fit me anymore, but, um, you know, I remember that I was in college when these jeans fit, and throwing them away would be like representing this, throwing away this part of my life. Um, so that's a sort of sentimental attachment. There's also instrumental um, attachments, so people that um, have trouble throwing things out because they just feel like that they might need it someday. Um, so you know, this they may have multiple packages of band aids, but you know, what if when I get injured and I use up one package, then I'll need another one. Um, so they they store more than one item. Um, the third is uh, intrinsic, so that the um, the there's an aesthetic uh, to what they're saving. So. Um, you know, somebody might have a, you know, a container of a little plastic bottle caps, and um, they would say, "Oh, you know, look how look how beautiful these bo bottle caps are there," um, and have you know just a tremendous appreciation for the color and textures. Um, so those are the three different uh, reasons why um, it's thought that people have difficulty um, parting with their possessions. There's really a lot of distress um, associated with discarding. So, um, you know, some individuals would um, imbue, um, you know, a, an object with a, with a personality. I couldn't, I couldn't throw uh, this empty food container away because how would that food container feel? Um, so, um, this kind of transferring of a of a part of themselves to the object as well. There's a lot of reasons why individuals with hoarding disorder have difficulty um, uh, with acquiring objects as well. So um, a lot of people um, find objects um, and, and sort of talk about them as treasures. And there's a lot of positive uh, reinforcement uh, around that. So uh, a lot of individuals who um, um, have, have this inclination of, of acquiring um, objects will tend to kind of avoid, um, you know, flea markets where will avoid places in town where they can um, accumulate these things. So even though they wouldn't say they have um, difficulty acquiring, they may be engaging in this kind of avoidance behavior um, to, to try and uh, prevent from uh, gathering more things into their home. Based on a lot of research that was done uh, with these criteria, um, there seem to be differences between the phenomenology of OCD and hoarding disorder. Individuals with OCD have, have this element of um, anxiety. They're the intrusive, unwanted thoughts. Whereas individuals with hoarding disorder, really um, their phenomenology is they have a lot of difficulty um, parting with possessions. Um, this can lead to anxiety, but doesn't necessarily just um, uh, the, 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 sen the sensation of difficulty is also um, associated with a, a feeling of grief, a feeling of loss, um, sadness. Individuals may have other uh, disorders that um, may 
um, look like hoarding disorder um, and present also with clutter, um, but wouldn't necessarily uh, meet the criteria of DSM-5 for hoarding disorder. One example is obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, for example, somebody who had um, intrusive thoughts about contamination. They might feel like their floor is quite contaminated and if anything drops on their floor, a uh, pen, uh, lipstick, um, a container, as soon as it falls on the floor it's contaminated, they don't want to touch it, so it would just remain there. So you can imagine if this happened repeatedly, um, items would accumulate, clutter would form, but um, the, the, the motivation for the uh, clutter would be different than that of hoarding disorder. Collectors are typically very proud of their possessions. Um, they tend to display them. Uh, they tend to go to different kinds of conferences or meetings to, to talk about their, their possessions. Whereas individuals with hoarding really feel embarrassed about them and don't really um, display them in an organized fashion. Another common symptom of OCD involves concerns with contamination and uh, washing rituals that go with those. Most people, when they think of OCD, they think of uh, people who are washing their hands over and over again. And that is one of the most common uh, symptoms of OCD, where people are worried about uh, contaminating themselves. They worry that they might catch something. Uh, and as a result, uh, they do something over and over again to take away that contamination. So someone might uh, touch a garbage can and then go and wash their hands over and over again or touch a doorknob um, and, and cleanse themselves of that. Uh, they might take repeated showers, uh, might take long repeated showers. Uh, they might rub cream on their hands over and over again to take away um, the contamination if they can't access water, for example. But in some way, they are uh, decontaminating themselves. With OCD, the, the fear that someone might come to harm uh, applies to themselves and also applies to other people. So they might worry that they're going to contaminate themselves or they might worry that they'll contaminate somebody else. So an obsession might be that if I uh, you know, touch my child after I touch a doorknob, then they might catch something. And as a result, uh, they worry that the child will get sick. So as a result, they might have the child wash their hands over and over again, or maybe they'll wash their hands over and over again before they touch a child. Uh, so it can take both, both forms. What makes it a ritual is that they do something repetitively in a, in a certain systematic way. Although you see avoidance in all anxiety disorders, what makes a ritual a ritual in OCD is the fact that it has a very systematic quality, so that they won't just check something once or twice, but they might come up with a system. And different people will do it in different ways. So they might uh, wash their hands for 10 minutes, or they might repeat their actions a certain number of times uh, in a day, uh, and so on. So there's different ways that they might come up with a formula to decontaminate themselves. Uh, maybe wiping something four times towards the right, or wiping something to the left four times, and then if they miss it, then they have to go back and start all over again. So as you can imagine, this could take a long time. It's the interesting with OCD is how intrusive the obsessions are. So contamination, for example, the contamination fear started uh, in a public toilet, and then it got associated with the woman she was with, um, who went to the toilet with her. Uh, and then it got associated with uh, the place she lived in, and so on. Then it got associated with uh, the photographs that she had of the woman in the house. So you can feel your fears of contamination could be of a thing, of a person, of a city, of a name, of a photo. Just about anything could become contaminated by this process of association.
frequently I am asked about uh, treatment options for OCD, and uh, there are uh, effective therapies for the condition. In the realm of psychosocial treatments, the most commonly uh, administered effective therapy is cognitive behavioral therapy and there's a specific component of that uh, approach that is used called exposure with response prevention. Um, it's a, a procedure that's usually done in collaboration with the client so the pacing for any exercises are uh, based upon what the client articulates that they could handle and it basically moves in the direction of practicing getting into situations that might provoke the obsession and then not doing the compulsion that would go with that obsession. And um, it's not as scary as it sounds. A lot of clinicians have some reluctance to uh, practice that form of therapy. But, um, but if it's done properly and it's done in collaboration with the client, uh, it's one that one can be done without too much fear being produced on the part of the client and produces relief pretty quickly for most sufferers if they are able to engage in the uh, exercise. It's usually practiced with the clinician in the office, uh, or in some cases, if clinicians feel comfortable doing this, they would leave the office to practice things out in the environment. Uh, and then people are asked to practice async between sessions. Uh, so that's usually the way treatment goes. Uh, there are some other psychosocial treatments that frankly worsen the condition that uh, may be perfectly acceptable uh, treatments for other disorders but for OCD tend to worsen them. Uh, the example in the category of psychodynamic treatments, which um, often is exploratory in nature, at least the way it's rendered in many domains, uh, and maybe is fine for some psychological conditions, but in the category of uh, OCD, because it's exploratory and it asks questions that inquire about possible origins for the disorder, it actually fosters a little bit more doubting uh, which is the very nature of the disorder to begin with. And so that should really be avoided uh, at all costs. People really should get more structured and uh, definitively OCD-oriented treatment.